archive of the uh, Science and Society Network and Alfred Deakin Institute of Citizenship and Globalization COVID-19 seminar series. I am Emma Koval, I'm Professor of Anthropology uh, at the Alfred Deakin Institute and the Science and Society Network. And I am delighted to have Frederick Keck uh, join us today. He is the head of the Labo Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Sociale at the Collège de France. Um, he has been head of research at Musée de Quai Branly in Paris. He has a background in philosophy and in anthropology. And he is the uh, author of a uh, really wonderful and timely recent book, Avian Reservoirs. And it is uh, currently available completely uh, open access with uh, Duke University Press. And I do encourage you to take advantage of that, um, to read it as well as, as order a, a, a hard copy. Um, so we will, uh, Frederick will uh, speak to us for about 45 minutes and then we will have uh, plenty of time for a discussion. So please um, think of questions, uh, write them uh, in the chat on the YouTube stream. Um, also feel free to use the chat to, to comment on things as we go along. Um, Tao Fan, my esteemed colleague, is moderating the chat and she'll be sharing um, uh, references and links as well as we go along. So I will uh, we'll go ahead now with Frederick and thank you so much for joining us very early in the morning in Paris. Thank you very much, Emma. It's a pleasure to be with you at uh, Deakin University and I'm happy to share my work. Uh, the PowerPoint I will present um, has been uh, built uh, in January for presentation of uh, the book um, Avian Reservoirs, Virus Hunters and Bird Watchers in Chinese Sentinel Post at um, the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and I have not updated it because uh, the, 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 I, I, I introduced the book with the first events of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. But if I had to update it, uh, uh, I would add so many slides that I prefer to uh, stick with the first stages of the pandemic. But I uh, propose to introduce bad carers in the uh, seminar for today because um, I hope that the conceptual framework I propose in this uh, book uh, can be applied to um, relations between uh, humans and, and bats. Um, in the anticipation of uh, a pandemic such as COVID-19. Uh, and I, I imagine that uh, uh, this pandemic will lead to uh, transformations in the relations between humans and bats as important as uh, the transformations in relations between humans and birds that I observed in China in, in the last 20 years. Uh, this book uh, is based on uh, a fieldwork I've made uh, in Hong Kong uh, and um, predominantly Hong Kong, but also Taiwan and Singapore uh, between 2007 and 2014. And the book has been written between 2014 and 2016 uh, while I was the head of the research department at the Musée du Cabrani. Um, and, and so the, the, the book um, is not about the, the current pandemic, <clears throat> but it is an attempt to think about how relations between humans and animals are conserved. Uh, I use the term conserved because working in a museum was a major uh, influence on the writing of the book. Um, uh, and that's hence the title Avian Reservoirs, which is a play on um, the idea of a reservoir for the mutation of viruses, but also the idea of a place uh, where um, the materialities of birds are concerned. And I will come back to that at the end. <coughs> so I will start with the uh, current COVID-19 pandemic. As you all know, uh, uh, in, at the end of December 2019, a cluster of uh, atypical Ammonia was detected in the city of Wuhan by physicians uh, who soon realized that this um, new respiratory disease was very similar to SARS. And this was confirmed by the genetic analysis of the virus. 
which was very similar to uh, viruses found on, found on bats uh, uh, in, in the last few years. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the animal uh, vector for the transmission of this uh, new coronavirus from bats to humans um, has been uh, searched. In January, there was the hypothesis that it was coming from a snake. It was a, a, a very weak hypothesis because no emerging virus has been found on a snake. Um, today, the hypothesis of the pangolin is taken seriously, although uh, um, uh, no um, butcher uh, working with pangolins has been found with COVID-19, but uh, there were traces of the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 on pangolins coming from Malaysia. And um, uh, the, the virus, the cluster has been found around a wet market <coughs> in Wuhan, uh, where there were uh, suspicions that um, animals were sold for uh, Chinese traditional medicine. And among these animals, you can, find, you can imagine that they were pangolins. But in the investigations I made on wet markets, and this is a project that I'm going to carry on in the next years, uh, going back to Wuhan, uh, I found that the wet markets uh, sell mostly um, uh, live animal for food, such as uh, chicken or, or fish. And sometimes in, in, in weaker proportions, uh, animals for Chinese traditional medicine, such as turtles or uh, scorpions. On the, on, on the right side of the slide, you, you can see this um, coronavirus. Uh, the term coronavirus comes from the fact that uh, it is, as every virus, uh, an RNA uh, uh, protein in uh, a capsid um, that takes the form, the shape of a, of a crown. Um, and it, this, its receptors attach uh, to uh, the cells of the respiratory tract. It seems that this coronavirus um, is very good at attaching at respiratory cells, uh, hence its contagiosity. You don't need to have a big viral load <clears throat> to infect uh, human cells. And also uh, it can transmit in small quantities in, in air, uh, not only by the droplets, but only by, um, maybe only by speaking. You don't need to cough to transmit the, the, the virus. Uh, only by speaking uh, is, is a potentiality of transmission. So this virus transmitted uh, successfully from bats to humans through an unknown animal, and then successfully from humans to humans by uh, 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 respiratory contact. Hence the measures that have been taken by the Wuhan authorities of controlling the population, because the lethality of this, of this virus has been quite low since the beginning, uh, around 1%, and uh, mostly elderly people um, uh, with other diseases, comorbidity. Uh, but the contagiosity was so high that there was um, very quickly a, a, a warning on its capacity to cause a pandemic. Now, the other reason why uh, the Chinese authority reacted so strongly was that this virus uh, was very similar. It was actually a member of the same family as the SARS virus. And the SARS virus was the first time, uh, the, the SARS crisis was the first time uh, a coronavirus uh, uh, um, became zoonotic, that is, it, it, it transmitted successfully from animals to humans. We knew coronaviruses among animals, among humans, but we didn't know uh, that they could transmit from one to the other. And coronaviruses cause benign diseases in humans and animals, but when it transmits to, from animals to humans, it causes severe disease because it, the immune system doesn't, doesn't know uh, the virus and, and reacts to the coronavirus in a very bizarre way causing what um, is now uh, famous as cytokine storm. And uh, the other striking aspect of uh, uh, SARS was that it infected not only uh, humans, and mostly uh, young people for uh, the SARS virus, by contrast with the, COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, but also it, it infected a lot of uh, um, uh, hospital staff because it uh, uh, replicates very successfully in closed uh, habitats uh, and spaces such as uh, uh, emergency rooms. Um, and so even if the, the number of casualties of SARS was not very high, it affected roughly uh, 8,000 people and uh, killing 10% uh, uh, of them. Uh, it was very spectacular to see all these 
hospital staff dying from this new disease. And that's why it was called uh, Asians 9-11. First, because it was transmitted by planes. So that's the famous story of a, of a, of a doctor from Guangzhou who um, uh, uh, infected 10, 10 pers around 10 persons in a hotel, Metropole uh, Hotel in Kowloon. Uh, and then these uh, 10 persons uh, flew to Beijing, Taipei, Bangkok, um, um, uh, Hanoi um, and Toronto. And that's why it became pandemic and not only an Asian uh, epidemic. Um, and, um, and so it, 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 it was traveling by air, uh, by, by, by plane, but also so as very similar to uh, the terrorists uh, in, in New York, but also the, the first persons who were infected were hospital staff, very similar to the fire workers in uh, in, in New York at the time of the uh, Manhattan Tower uh, uh, crash. So this narrative of SARS as, nine, as Asia's 9-11 is very strong to understand the trauma that it caused among Asian populations despite the, the low cost in terms of human lives. And that's why it was a, a real story of heroes and bad guys. The bad guys were the ministers of uh, Beijing government who denied the severity of the disease for a long time like the Minister of Health and the Mayor of Beijing who had to step down. And the heroes were this guy, Zhong Nanshan, who was the director of the Guangzhou Institute of Respiratory Diseases, um, who, who was the first in China, in mainland China, to raise alert on the severity of the disease, uh, saying it was not a banal uh, pneumonia caused by a known bacteria, but, but a new respiratory disease caused by a, a new virus. And he was also the first to send samples of uh, the 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 <clears throat> from patients uh, to Hong Kong where the virus was identified, and I will come back to this story. So, um, and, and I want to say that Zhong Nanshan was one of the main uh, actors of the mobilization of the Chinese authorities against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. He particularly was one of the authors of the report of WHO uh, in on 28 February uh, 2020, um, uh, saying basically that the measures that China had taken against uh, COVID-19 were good because basically it was the, one of the uh, advisors of the uh, Beijing government. So the heroes of SARS were the heroes of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So I want to raise three questions about uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, <clears throat> that will uh, uh, lead me to um, develop my conceptual framework. First, can Wuhan become a sentinel post for pandemic preparedness in, in China? So a lot of us discovered Wuhan at the occasion of this um, crisis, but Wuhan is a, is a city of 11 million people in central China. It's one of the biggest industrial centers in mainland China, and it has a history of contact with Western investors since the 19th century. It was actually a trading post on the Jiangxi River. Um, and in, 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 in 1927, I think, it, it merged three cities uh, on, on the river, on the banks of the Jiangxi River, uh, Wuhan, Wuhan, Hangzhou, and the third one, I don't I forgot the name, um, to build one big city that became then one of the uh, sites of investment uh, uh, for in industry uh, uh, in the Chinese Republic and then in the Maoist regime and then also uh, after the period of modernization. Uh, French investors have been very strong, for example, to build uh, uh, optic industry, car industry. Um, but also it was the site of uh, the Chinese revolution in 1911, uh, when uh, the Chinese army uh, revolted against uh, the funding of uh, a, a railway uh, by, by the imperial power. Uh, uh, the, the, the imperial power had um, <clears throat> a trust, had, had, um, relied on uh, Western banks, uh, uh, banking system, to um, Western investors to fund the uh, Chinese railway. And so it was against the investment of, the, of Western uh, <clears throat> actors uh, that the Chinese army had revolted. And so when Xi Jinping heard the news in January that there was a new virus in Wuhan, it probably uh, rang him a bell of this event of the 1911 uh, revolution, uh, 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 because as we know, uh, Xi Jinping presents himself as the new emperor uh, of China. So what was the trouble with uh, Wuhan in 2020? Well, 
One of the troubles was that uh, 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 um, the Beijing government had uh, inaugurated in 2018 <clears throat> a, a laboratory uh, precisely to work on uh, uh, emerging viruses. Uh, it's called a P4 lab. It's a biosecurity level four laboratory working on uh, very dangerous pathogens like uh, Ebola, H5N1 or SARS. And this lab has been uh, uh, designed uh, and built uh, after 2004 by the Chinese Academy of Sciences with the help of the French Academy of Sciences. And this collaboration has been <clears throat> a success in some way because uh, it's a technical, technical technological performance, but it's also been a failure in the sense that the, the, the French authorities didn't have any access to the laboratory after, to, after the inauguration. So there was a, a, a lot of suspicion that the, the new coronavirus um, uh, jumped out or um, uh, was released from uh, this P4 lab. Well, I visited this P4 lab in 2012 when it was uh, built by the French Academy of Sciences. I was very proud to show to uh, French experts um, this construction. And I, I can bet that it was impossible to release uh, a virus from this construction because the, the number of, of levels of security is, is as high as in the most secure uh, nuclear plants, if you want. What is, what, what is more probable is that uh, two kilometers from, <clears throat> uh, from the wet markets where the cluster was identified uh, was a, a laboratory of the CDC with um, uh, Chinese experts working on bad viruses. And we can imagine a release of um, a bad coronavirus from uh, this uh, CDC lab. But what is very interesting <coughs> is to understand that uh, for the Chinese authorities, Wuhan was a sentinel to detect um, uh, coronaviruses uh, because it's very close to um, the forest of uh, South China where precisely bats are moving to uh, human habitats and transmit new coronaviruses. So the idea of Chinese authorities was to be close to the site of emergence to detect as early as possible. And uh, so of course the, the sequence of the coronavirus was actually um, made in Shanghai, not in Wuhan, but we can imagine that Wuhan had a bank of coronaviruses in, 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 in fridges, actually. It was cryopolitics, uh, to quote Emma's uh, book. Um, and that the comparison between the sequence of the new coronavirus and, and, and uh, all the sequences of bad coronaviruses was, was made in, in Wuhan. And, and it's very interesting to think that uh, uh, Hong Kong has been the sentinel post uh, to prepare for pandemics uh, in the last 15 years. But the, the project of the, of the Chinese government was to replace Hong Kong by, by Wuhan. The second question I want to ask is, are Wuhan, so are Wuhan uh, hospital staff um, trained enough by simulations of pandemic? This is an exercise uh, of uh, pandemic preparedness that I um, uh, 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 observed in Hong Kong in 2009. Uh, it was called Exercise Redwood. These uh, exercises always bear the name of, of trees uh, to show that it's very natural to prepare for emerging viruses. And, <clears throat> and this exercise was made by hospital staff. They were playing their own role. And there were uh, volunteers who were playing uh, patients. And they had tags uh, to show uh, the symptoms they had. And, um, and, and the hospital staff were um, doing the gestures they had to make uh, in, in time of emergency, of, of pandemic emergencies, for example, triage of uh, uh, patients with influenza uh, um, and patients with pandemic influenza and patients with influenza-like illness, um, and then, and then uh, curing them um, or sending them to the pro proper hospitals. So it's basically a work of triage. And we know that in, terms of, in times of emergency, particularly as we saw in Italy, these uh, decisions of triage in humanitarian context of emergency are very difficult to take. So the role of simulation <clears throat> is to train hospital staff to take uh, emotional decisions uh, in ordinary time to prepare them for the, the, these decisions in, in times of emergency. The third question is, uh, are vaccines against SARS available against the new coronavirus? So this was a question that we found in the news, but of course now we know it's not possible. Well, at first there was no vaccine for the SARS virus because the SARS virus uh, jumped back to animals uh, too quickly. 
Um, but <clears throat> the reason why this question was raised was that the, the, there were many vaccines stockpiled against uh, uh, influenza. And so stockpiling vaccines for influenza became the model for pandemic preparedness. This decision was taken by this guy, Edwin Kilburn, uh, uh, who was the head of the uh, strat National Strategic Stockpile in the US, uh, built after 1976, which was the time of uh, what was known as swine flu fiasco, when the uh, US authorities uh, vaccinated 10% of the population uh, uh, against H1N1, a uh, uh, new H1N1 virus. And, that to stop because there was uh, side effects which were uh, very problematic. Uh, but the, the idea of stockpiling and adapting uh, the stockpile uh, to a priority um, uh, targets or um, uh, like nurses uh, came from this uh, period. And the debate about stockpiling uh, became very high after the 2009 H1N1 uh, flu virus uh, when uh, uh, um, authorities, particularly in Western countries, uh, bought to pharmaceutical industries, which is a major market, and then stockpiled um, vaccines, uh, mass, and antivirals. So the antiviral for flu is um, um, Tamiflu uh, and also Relenza. Uh, and so, as, as you know, the, the, the debate around uh, SARS-CoV-2 was precisely about uh, masks and antivirals. In France, we have we have our uh, national star uh, who promoted hydroxychloroquine, and uh, Donald Trump was one of his uh, best fans. Uh, uh, and so, this question of stockpiling uh, was one of the main questions in the infrastructure to prepare for pandemic. Now, um, I want to take these three questions and show that they are conceptually related. And this is the framework that I uh, build at the end of the, of the book, Avian Reservoirs. Um, I rely on the work of uh, Andy Lakoff and Stephen Collier, who show that these three techniques of preparedness uh, uh, were invented in the US um, in the 1950s in the context of uh, the anticipation of a nuclear attack. And so that's what I call the three S because as, as a French philosopher, I like to systematize things. Um, so the Sentinel simulation and storage. But what I, what I also want to show is that these three uh, uh, techniques are doubled uh, in what I call synergetic techniques that are techniques that are borrowed to hunting societies, uh, which allow humans to take the perspective of animals. Um, and in pastoral techniques, such as I borrow the, the term to Michel Foucault, uh, techniques uh, that allow <clears throat> humans uh, to take a, 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 a transcendent perspective on uh, other humans or other animals as a flock. So sentinels become sacrifice. It's the question of um, how many humans or how many animals can be killed uh, to um, uh, before the alert is, is managed. Uh, so sentinels raise early warning signals, and then there's the question of who is going to sacrifice in the management of the, of the new epidemic. Uh, um, simulation becomes scenarios, uh, which is uh, the writing of a sequence of action, um, and storage becomes stockpiling, which is uh, storage basically uh, stores anything. Uh, as we can see among hunter societies, uh, they store anything. This is what Michel, uh, Claude Lévis also has called bricolage. But pastoral societies store things uh, to prepare for uh, emergency situations. And so this, these three techniques I've observed in three ethnography sites, although they are combined in each of these uh, sites. So sentinels I've observed mostly in Hong Kong, simulation in Singapore, and storage and stockpiling in Taiwan because Taiwan has a very good pharmaceutical industry. And as we've seen in the last months, there's been a competition between Taiwan and mainland China in what is called the diplomacy of masks <clears throat> because they can uh, make and, and stockpile masks. And now they're going to work on vaccines very quickly and efficiently. Now, I also argue that these uh, three techniques raise philosophical problems that can be solved by anthropological concepts or domains. Sentinels raise the philosophical problem of truth. It's the problem of what is a true alert or a false alarm. 
And this problem has been <clears throat> approached in the anthropology of myth, uh, as you can remember from Claude Lévi-Strauss. Myth is a narrative of a period when humans and animals were not separated. And uh, as we see uh, with the myths of the COVID-19 pandemic coming from bats, this proximity between humans and bats is very difficult to trace. Uh, and then the unfolding of the myth is precisely all the conflicts coming from this uh, uh, original proximity. Um, then simulation can be compared to ritual in the sense that it's, it's, a, it's a very organized sequence of action that can be written or unwritten and that <clears throat> prepares human for um, a kind of mystical encounters with invisible beings uh, in, in times of emergency. And then storage um, can be compared to the, to the uh, philosophical problem, and sorry, and the philosophical problem of simulation is reality. What is a realistic scenario? Then storage uh, raises the, the problem of equity. Uh, what is a fair distribution of mass vaccines and, and, and antivirals? As we've seen in the debates between China, Taiwan, Europe, US. And this problem reminds anthropologists of all the works that have been done, particularly after Marcel Mauss on exchange. Uh, and it, we can even think of the, of the virus as a gift in the sense of Marcel Mauss, since the virus is something that can be good if you make a vaccine out of, of a virus, but it can be bad uh, if you are infected by a virus that your immun immune system doesn't know. <clears throat> so this is the cover of the book. Um, and in this book, I try to combine uh, two um, theoretical trends. But one is the anthropology of biosecurity uh, after the works of uh, Paul Rabineau, Andy Lakoff, Stephen Collier. And the other is the ontological turn of in, uh, in anthropology after the works of um, uh, Bruno Latour, Philippe Descola, Martin Oldbrad, Martin Pedersen, and uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro. And so I combine these two th trends in the argument that Sentinel devices uh, <clears throat> precisely uh, allow humans to take the perspective of, of animals. And so I argue that sentinel devices should, should be described not through a naturalistic ontology of the quantitative measure of risk and threat, but through an animistic ontology that takes the perspective of birds on the threats that affect them before affecting humans. I also argue that human and non-human anim animals communicate through sentinel devices as hunters communicate with their prey in animistic societies. And I also argue that pastoral techniques of preparedness mix the animistic ontology of synergetic techniques with the naturalistic ontology of capitalism in an analogistic ontology regulated by sacrifice. So it's very theoretically loaded and, and heavy, sorry for um, the, the theoretical load, but I hope it becomes, this becomes clearer in the rest of the talk. So now I want to move to more ethnographic analysis uh, and I will uh, develop some of the <clears throat> observations I've made in, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has been de designed as a sentinel post for pandemic preparedness since 1972 uh, when Microbiologists from Australia observed that um, uh, the proximity between uh, pigs and chickens in, uh, Chinese port in Chinese farms made them the perfect laboratory for the mutations of the flu virus uh, jumping to humans and causing pandemic uh, influenza. So as you may know, influenza is a seasonal disease uh, uh, causing deaths among um, elderly people, a uh, weak immune system. And, 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 and regularly there, there, there are new uh, viruses, flu viruses coming from animals, uh, so birds and pigs, and causing uh, death among uh, young organisms with strong immune system. And the reason why uh, the last uh, uh, flu pandemics have emerged uh, in uh, South Asia, uh, South China, like Hong Kong, Singapore, 1957, 1968, causing what, between 1 million and 2 million deaths each time, is the proximity between <clears throat> China's uh, traditional uh, agricultural system and the hubs of uh, uh, global trade like Singapore or Hong Kong. 
This hypothesis of Charles Chan as the influenza epicenter was made by these three, by three Australian microbiologists who had been trained in Canberra uh, in the school of Frank McFarlane Burnett, who is the founder of the Australian School of um, Microbiology and Immunology. Um, and uh, who was trained in Cambridge. Um, and uh, Warwick Anderson has written wonderful articles about uh, Burnett. Uh, and um, I, uh, I, was, I was fortunate to meet two of these guys, uh, uh, Kenneth Shortridge and Robert Webster, uh, who were considered as the, so Shortridge was, was the emperor and Webster was the Pope of influenza. They were the, the global experts. In, influenza pandemics at the time of my research. Graham Lever, uh, the third one had passed away. And these pictures that uh, Shortridge gave me, um, sent me, um, uh, was taken in 1976 at the WHO uh, World Health Organization Committee on the Ecology of Infectious Diseases. This committee was chaired by a veterinary officer of uh, WHO, Martin Kaplan was supporting the idea that um, uh, it was possible to anticipate uh, pandemics uh, particularly flu pandemics, uh, but also other emerging diseases uh, by the monitoring and surveillance of uh, uh, animal reservoirs. And um, I'd like to say that uh, uh, on this picture, Shortridge looks like Bruno Latour and Webster looks like Michel Foucault with the, with the, with the color. Um, so uh, Webster and Laver uh, uh, were uh, the two guys who proposed the idea that uh, uh, birds were the, the reservoir of uh, influenza viruses because they were walking on the, on the shores of um, the Australian sea uh, and they discovered a, a, a dead bird and they had worked uh, all day long on the antibodies of flu in the laboratory and they thought, well, maybe these, these birds have flu. And so they started to sample the bird and they found uh, antibodies that really looked like um, human antibodies. And, uh, and then they started the collecting birds from not, uh, first the Australian Sea and then all, the whole world. And they, they built a, a, a viral bank uh, in Memphis, Tennessee at St. Jude's Hospital which is now the main uh, uh, WHO uh, center for influenza uh, in the US. And Shortridge, uh, um, roughly at the same, so this hypothesis was made in the 1960s, but in 1972, Shortridge moved from uh, Canberra to Hong Kong and renovated the, the old microbiology department, which had its glory at the time of Alexander Yassin, who had discovered the, the, the plague bacillus in 1894. And um, he uh, designed the microbiology department as a, a place to uh, um, a sample uh, flu viruses from uh, chickens and pigs in South China. Uh, and so he built a small viral bank. Uh, but what he, what he mostly did, and that was very courageous at the time, 19, in the 1970s, was um, uh, have good relationship with what is called Guanxi in Chinese. Uh, with uh, uh, agricultural authorities in, in Guangdong. And that's how he, he, he had all these uh, samples from, from China. And this, uh, th this helped him build the hypothesis of South China as an in, in influenza epicenter based on the circulation of, of flu viruses between chick ducks, chickens, and pigs in the uh, traditional agricultural system. Shortridge didn't have the idea that uh, the emergence of flu viruses uh, in the Chinese agricult uh, traditional agricultural system was amp would be amplified by uh, what is called the livestock revolution, uh, particularly with the uh, modernization of, of China. This, this came later. But, but the, the scenario built by Shortridge um, of a, a flu virus coming from China and, and, and causing a, a pandemic was um, in some way realized in 1997 with the emergence of the h 5 n one The chronology of the, of the crisis is very interesting. Uh, in February uh, 1997, uh, uh, 12 uh, people are infected by a new flu virus and eight of them die, which is very high uh, lethality for, for an emerging virus. And 5,000 chickens die of the same virus. And <coughs> um, no pigs were found with this virus. So there was the hypothesis that it jumped directly from birds to humans, uh, causing a very high immune distress. And um, 
uh, this guy, Keiji Fukuda, who was uh, uh, the, in charge of uh, uh, flu va f uh, respiratory diseases at the, at the CDC in the US, he's a, he's a Japanese American, came to Hong Kong and he advised this woman, Margaret Chan, who was the, the head of the uh, uh, health department since 1994. And they, they, they thought that there was something very bad. And Chartridge was, of course, advising them that there was something very bad happening. And then in, in, November, in, in July 1997, it was the end, handover of uh, the British colony to, 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 to the Chinese Repub Republic. And uh, the, the, the Chinese Republic wanted to have a, a strong political gesture to, to mark its, its new sovereignty. So in November, they decided to kill uh, 1.5 million chickens, that is all the live chickens, uh, all the live uh, poultry on the, on the territory, including uh, ducks, geese, and quails. And this gesture uh, was considered as efficient because the H5N1 virus disappeared from uh, the, the human population. Uh, and there were some uh, H5N1 virus coming back through birds, and uh, and the Chinese and the the, the Chinese government uh, of Hong Kong uh, killed or killed um, uh, all the live poultry each time they would find uh, H5N1 uh, on on a duck or, or no, there were no duck but on a on a chicken. Um, but it's very interesting to notice that Margaret Chan was the person in charge of all this. Uh, massive killing she's she's remembered in 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 hong kong as as the killer of poultry um she was going to poultry market and saying no look i can eat uh, chicken now you can also eat chicken uh and and in 2006 um, she uh, became the head of uh, the world health organization with the support of the beijing government now the real heroes of uh, uh, sorry uh, so 1997 is H5N1 and then in 2003 the scenario of emergence of a new virus coming from China was realized with SARS and, and these uh, people were the SARS heroes it's a picture I uh, took at the um, Hong Kong uh, Museum of Medical History uh, and um, so after Alexander you seen you have this this Persons. And it's very interesting to notice that if you compare this picture to the picture of WHO that I, that I showed from 1976, where all the experts were white, I think there was one woman. Uh, and, and here you have one, two. <laughs> and here you have one, um, one guy, John Nichols, who was a pathologist uh, uh, from Hong Kong University, but all the other are Asian. Uh, so let me just introduce you very briefly. So Guanyi is a um, from Jiangsu province, uh, he, he, he left China in 19, very rural province. He, he left China in 1989 to work with Robert Webster in the US, 1999, that's a, that's a major date. And, and then he returned to Hong Kong in 1997 to work on the uh, on flu. Uh, and he's the one who discovered uh, that the, he could go to China in 2003 uh, and take samples. And he discovered that the SARS virus were coming from uh, wet markets uh, with people uh, killing uh, uh, civets. And then they discovered that there were there was SARS among bats. So he's the author of the of the bat origin of the hypothesis of the bat origin of, of SARS coronaviruses. Kai Wen Yuan, who, who is uh, who was the head of the microbiology department at that time, is a, is a surgeon from the Hong Kong uh, elite and is still one of the major um, uh, actors in the media on the uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, and he was he was implementing biosecurity measures. Uh, John Nichols was the pathologist. Malik Paris uh, from Sri Lanka uh, studied in Oxford University, and in 1997, Webster uh, uh, hired him to work on the human aspects of influenza viruses, and he discovered uh, the coronavirus um, causing SARS. So. Uh, He's the main hero, as you can see uh, from his position in the picture. And he was my main interlocutor uh, during my research. Uh, he's, a, he's a great a great scientist and a great philosopher of medicine. Hong Ling Chen and Leo Poon were the two technicians in, in some way <coughs> who were doing the laboratory work. Uh, Hong Ling Chen is from China and Leo Poon is from uh, Hong Kong. Um, so this is the the, the heroes uh, emerging in times of uh, emergence of of, um, of crisis. 
But uh, I also studied the, the work of uh, virologists in, in more ordinary times. And what virologists do is not only advise the government to uh, uh, kill uh, animals and, and close wet markets in times of, of zoonotic crisis, but what they, they, all, they do on a more regular basis is to um, collect samples from uh, animals and, and check that uh, nothing new is emerging. Uh, and that's what the Chinese veterinarians are doing in the, in the markets of uh, the, the Fujian province, <laughs> very close to Hong Kong. And this is a team of Australian and Indian uh, virologists. Gavin Smith is now working at uh, Singapore uh, uh, Duke University, um, Duke and US. And uh, Vijay and Justin uh, are still working. You know, Vijay is working with him still, and Justin has returned to the US. Uh, but what these guys were doing is what they call the, the dry lab, uh, by contrast with the wet lab where you cultivate uh, viruses and cells. The dry lab is basically taking the samples uh, from, um, I mean, dis desiccating and identifying viruses from the samples and then sequencing them and then downloading them on a viral bank, a gene bank, and then uh, build phylogenetic trees to see if something new is emerging or trace retrospectively through what is called the molecular root clock, the date of emergence of new viruses. What is also made on a more regular basis is the monitoring of farms uh, and the implementation of biosecurity. So this is KYUN uh, checking um, uh, the farm of this guy, Wang Yichan. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to work in this farm because um, uh, this farm had been the site of an outbreak, um, as it often happens in, in, in Hong Kong in 2009, uh, 2008, December 2008. And, so he had all these uh, virologists, uh, government experts, and journalists, and then there was an anthropologist among them. So I asked, I asked him if I could stay. He was very surprised because usually journalists don't stay in the farm. So I stayed for uh, uh, more than a week and uh, I could uh, um, work with uh, this woman who was um, vaccinating uh, chickens. <coughs> and others were collecting feces and feeding chickens. And what I find very interesting in this farm was that uh, at, at, the, at the beginning of the, of the uh, cages, of the row of cages, um, uh, there, there were uh, sentinel chickens who were not vaccinated. And the idea was that these uh, sentinel chickens would die first when a uh, flu virus enters the, the farm. And the, the Chinese term for um, sentinel chickens is Xiao Bingji, which literally means uh, uh, chickens that whistle like soldiers. So the idea that chickens would be considered as soldiers in the, in the fight against um, an enemy, an invisible enemy, which is the influenza virus, I found very interesting. I was also very interested in between uh, bird watchers and Buddhist practitioners. Um, and I have to go very quick on that, but for an anthropologist, it was one of the major you know, stimulating facts. Um, so when I arrived in Hong Kong in 2007, I sent an email to the Hong Kong Birdwatching Society and they told me, oh, I I'm really happy to talk with an anthropologist because we have a, a major discussion with the government on the, <clears throat> the control of H5N1 on wild birds. And they said, each time there's a wild bird found with H5N1 in the Hong Kong territory, the Hong Kong government is closing our uh, uh, natural reserves. And, one of the major natural reserves to observe birds is Maipo um, marshlands uh, or wetlands at the end of the uh, Pearl River Delta, um, uh, where uh, uh, around 500 migratory birds are, uh, uh, 500 species of migratory birds are passing each year. And this is a reserve run by the World Wildlife Fund, which is <coughs> a British colonial creation. So that's one of the reasons why the Hong Kong government closes this site as a kind of reprisal for the colonial past of, the, uh, of Hong Kong. There's also other sites of uh, observations of birds like uh, the Taiku Forest or uh, Porto Island. Uh, so there's a lot of very diverse sites to observe uh, birds. But what the, the bird watchers showed uh, was that uh, most of the cases of H4N1 on wild birds were found uh, uh, in Kowloon. And this is also the image of the, of the epicenter. Uh, it's a very strong image. Uh, and Kowloon was also the, the site of emergence of the SARS uh, coronavirus in 2003 on the hotel, Metro Park Hotel. And <coughs> the reason why uh, there are so many cases in Kowloon, which is the densest area in the world, is that Buddhist practitioners release birds in this area. 
So I, I, I did a lot of interviews in, with bird watchers, uh, not only in Hong Kong, but also in Taiwan, and traced the history of this uh, colonial uh, um, association founded in 1957 by uh, British uh, officers who were uh, basically going to the border with China and observing if, if the army <coughs> was, if the Chinese army was going to invade Hong Kong or if, if refugees were coming in, 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 in high loads. Uh, and they were also observing birds while observing China. And uh, in 1997, it became predominantly Chinese uh, with um, a, a Chinese meteorologist as uh, the head of the association. They were very proud to monitor biodiversity for the agriculture, fisheries and conservation department. And they had defended two sites against uh, uh, the, uh, the, a construction project in Long Valley, that's the Blackface Poondale fighting against the um, Kowloon uh, Canton Railway, and they defended Maipo against uh, its closure by the government by showing precisely that the H5 and 1 were, were found on the uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, bird, uh, bird market. And as you can see now, uh, these uh, bird watchers are, are, are predominantly Chinese and they buy a very heavy, uh, costly equipment to observe birds on this, um, on, on this construction site uh, that have been made by basically British um, uh, colonial officers. So this practice of releasing birds, I also document it as, as far as possible. Um, it, it is now illegal, well, it is not recommended. The, the Brit the, after the warning of the bird watchers, the, um, the Buddhist authorities in Hong Kong advised their uh, practitioners to release uh, turtles and fish uh, and shells rather than, than birds because what the bird watchers showed was that when these birds were released uh, after being stuck into cages, they often died because they were released in an improper environment. Also, some of them were infected by uh, diseases, uh, uh, among which uh, H5N1. But this practice has a very long history, and we can come back to that in the discussion in the Chinese tradition. And basically, the idea is that when you release a bird, it produces mercy, it produces uh, merits. Um, <clears throat> And so it is still practiced in, in, in the bird market of Hong Kong, but very illegally. And that's a picture that I could take in 2007. And what is very interesting is that the term for release is, in Chinese is function. And function literally means uh, release life or let live. And so when you are trained as I am in the biopolitics of Michel Foucault, the idea that the, the, the answer to the sovereign power of make die is let live is very interesting. And what is very interesting is also that <clears throat> uh, uh, bird watchers did not only, um, it was not only a fight between science and religion. It was really a controversy about what are the proper uh, ways to release life. Um, is it only a, a concern with soul or can you, can you uh, have a concern for the, for the bodies of the animals that you release? And that's why the bird watchers in Taiwan and Hong Kong uh, we're very uh, outspoken about the fact that uh, when birds are released, uh, it should be a public event. It should be uh, scientifically equipped. Uh, hence these books that they, uh, that they um, published. So this is a book of uh, religious release <coughs> function. And this is a book of scientific release, cursory function. And scientific release is when you release birds with a, a GPS antenna, uh, wildlife tracking, if you will. Uh, to follow uh, the trajectory of the birds uh, uh, and, and uh, work for their preservation. Okay, so I move to my conclusion. <laughs> um, all these uh, observations uh, on um, uh, wild birds and domestic poultry <clears throat> were an attempt to show that um, relations between humans and, and birds in times of pandemic preparedness are transformed um, uh, by uh, their design as sentinel, um, sentinel devices. Um, and the idea is that sentinel devices uh, raise early warning signals uh, for um, uh, threats affecting humans and birds, not only pandemics, but also um, nuclear radiations, uh, species extinction. And so working at the level of uh, relations between humans and birds allow to see how these sentinel uh, raise signals for threats that are global. 
so it's it's a shift between the the, the local and the global uh, that it is made from from the ethnographic side and that's why uh, it was <coughs> it was possible to think of a, of a sentinel chicken uh, as uh, an and and to, to think of the identification of hong kong as a territory with a sentinel chicken in a poultry farm this is very clear in the map that were made at the time of the spread of H5N1 uh, uh, in Europe and Africa. Hong Kong was the site of emergence of H5N1. And so the measures that had been applied in Hong Kong, like monitoring wild birds and poultry and killing suspected flocks, were applied to the rest of the world. So there is this shift from the local to the global. But there is another shift uh, from, from below, from the local to the, to the micro-local, to the organism. Because uh, uh, immunologists have worked on uh, what is called sentinel cells, which are uh, cells uh, like the, called also dendritic cells. And they are very similar to the cells we have in our brain because they have arms that allow these cells to capture the antigenic information of, of viruses and transmit th this information to uh, uh, immune cells that will do the proper work of uh, absorbing uh, uh, this uh, virus so that it doesn't become pathogen. And the, the hypothesis of <clears throat> immunologists is that uh, emerging viruses cause immune distress precisely because sentinel cells cannot do their work of capturing this information and, and send early warning signals of the presence of a new pathogen. And so the organism dies not, not of the virus itself, because the virus, of course, wants to replicate, but dies of the improper reaction of the immune system because sentinels, sentinel cells have not done their work. Okay, I, I go very quickly on that. The other I heard on sentinel, um, sentinel cells as, as a concept uh, it comes from ornithologists uh, um, uh, Avishag, uh, uh, Amot and Avishag Zahavi, who observe uh, birds in the Negev desert were basically competing between themselves to send sentinel signals. And, um, uh, and this comes from a, a rereading of Darwin's theory of the, of, of the costly signals and of the peacock tail, I can come back to that. Uh, the hypothesis also comes from the Musée du Quai So there's a whole aesthetics of showing bird materialities in times of, <coughs> of environmental disasters. That's, um, that's another hypothesis I propose in the third chapter of the book. And so I jump to my conclusion. Uh, to come back to the to the title of the of the book, uh, avian reservoirs. So uh, avian reservoirs um, can be read as stigmatizing Asian populations for their association with animals in wet markets. But I try to argue that they are also sites of intense human animal relations and interspecies communication, signaling common environmental threats. I also argue that avian reservoirs are epidemiological sites of surveillance where future pandemics are imagined and simulated, but also aesthetic resources for the conservation of past information and materialities like cultural museums and natural reserves. And finally, I argue that avian reservoirs are critical sites where the sacrificial interventions of pastoral power are resisted by perspective exchange between virus hunters and sentinel birds. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Frederick. So if you stop sharing your screen, we can get into the um, discussion. Right. Excellent. Yeah, uh, that was a beautiful um, tour through your uh, amazing book. Um, so I have questions, but we have a question from, from Le Levin Ahmed from the uh, YouTube chat. So I will let Levin go first. So um, he says, Frederick mentioned two tendencies in the contemporary philosophy, philosophical anthropology of biosecurity represented by Rabinow and Latour. Um, well, because what you we talked about, Foucault, Foucault and Latour being simulated in that uh, by those uh, virus hunters. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Yeah, so is there a, a, a contrast to be made um, between the uh, anthropology of biosecurity in the mm. Foucauldian Rabinow versus the Latourian school? Right. Well, that's the, that's the whole contrast between anthropology of biosecurity on one hand and anthropology of nature on the other hand. 
right? So uh, the Latour and the Scola are doing an anthropology of nature, not, not of, of biopolitics or biosecurity. Because they try to argue that nature is a modern construction and they, 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 tr they, they try to show how what we call nature is um, conceptualized and practiced in non-Western societies, right? And this is something that Rabino and his um, uh, followers are not doing because Rabino is doing an anthropology of the contemporary and basically an anthropology of the West. And that's why they are interested in biosecurity as the implementation of what Foucault called biopolitics. Because, well, you can argue that life, and this is also what Didier Fassin would, would say, that life is the way modern societies are thought about nature. Of course, modern societies don't talk a lot about nature, except when they are you know, scientists or uh, romantic artists, but they talk about life a lot because life is the way nature is uh, entangled in the technological apparatuses of uh, modern societies. So there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding between these two trends because the, 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 the anthropology of nature or the ontological turn in anthropology are, are criticizing the idea of nature from, from outside of modernity. And the anthropology of biosecurity observes modern societies and basically criticizes anthropology of nature for being romantic, you know, uh, romanticization of uh, uh, non-Western non, non or non-modern non society. And, and I think it's a major it's a major debate within contemporary society because it's the question of modernity. Do we want to observe modern societies or do we want to observe non-modern societies? So I tried I tried to combine the two, not only because I like these these people and they are they are good they are good people they are good people to talk with, but also because <clears throat> what I observe is a, is a, is is a very modern society. Is Hong Kong is a, is very modern, and at the same time, I think that there are poss uh, possibilities to resist uh, modernity through uh, uh, precisely the relation to nature that is built by uh, various hunters and bird watchers, which I call, which I call synergetic or animistic, if you like. Mm, yeah, it's wonderfully um, uh, innovative and provocative to think about um, invisible, to think about uh, micro microbes as invisible things and then to hmm. lead that into uh, the anthropology of, of hunter-gatherer societies. Um, yeah, I wonder if you will get any uh, pushback that either from uh, the the critiques of the ontological term that that is it's it's some kind it's it's a, another neo-colonialist basically in another mm -hmm. kind of form, or mm -hmm. on the other side from the science wars saying that you're kind of undermining the reality of of microbes or of mm -hmm. pandemics by. The, um, mm. comparing them to, you know, mm. invisible, in, invisible entities that hunter-gatherers mm. had to create rituals about. I mean, I wouldn't make mm. either of those critiques, but I just wondered if that's come up. Well, no, I, 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 these critiques are very fair. I think, I think these critiques come precisely from the misunderstanding of the um, ontological turn, um, which is to confound uh, the ontological turn with um, cultural relativism. Uh, and, and so the, the major step from cultural relativism of the 1960s to the ontological turn is precisely to say that ontologies are not cultures, right? If you say, if you say the anthropologist is going to observe a non-Western culture and bring back the lessons of wisdom from this culture, this is colonial, right? If you say, the, the anthropologist is going to observe the ontologies of, a, of, a, of another society. That is, the, the anthropologist is going to take seriously the, the claims of these people, like, you know, it's the, it's the famous Levi Brühl quote, like, like borrows our parakis. Huh? That's the ontology, uh, is you really take seriously the fact that for uh, borrow people in some situations, they are birds, right? Uh, that's the ontological term. You don't say that uh, they think they are birds or that uh, they believe they are birds, but they are birds, right? It's real. It's, it's, it's... So you take, you take seriously the fact that in specific situations, humans become birds. Uh, and that's Viveros de Castro, Deleuzean reading of um, the ontological uh, claims uh, or metaphysical reading, if you want. 
so so then it is not it is not a colonial claim. It's it's an anti-colonial uh, what Vivero de Castro calls uh, um, and uh, anti anti-cognitivist. Uh, uh, that is, it's it's a way to turn the representations of other as a <coughs> as a weapon against the cognitive claims of Western society. And that's why when I say that microbes are invisible entities in our societies, in the same way that non-Western societies perceive invisible entities, I don't want to say that one is more real than the other, right? Because you, then you can compare the, the, the techniques of protection that are built in Western societies and in non-Western societies. And then you understand what, what is the emotional reaction to the emergence of invisible beings. And, uh, and, that's, and, and that's why I think the, the question of reality should not be taken as a critical uh, stance in our debates in anthropology. I think the question of, and that's why I, I insisted a lot on, on simulations and scenarios, because the question of realism is a question that is raised from within the rituals that we observe, right? We need, we need to show how rituals make things real. We, don't, we, we, we should not argue between ourselves what we consider as real, because this is not something that we as anthropologists should say. I, I, I really believe that, because often philosophers say, well, for me, the real thing is that. As anthropologists, we, we need to be very skeptical about what is real, but we need to take very seriously what is real for the people we observe. Thank you. We have a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Keep them coming. Yeah. So from T Tessa Laird is asking about bats. And I also was interested in bats. So um, I, I need to open the uh, window to my cat because I am oh, invaded yeah. by animals. My <laughs> and my dog may bark at any moment. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay, the question is: How is it different with uh, COVID nineteen or SARS CoV two when bats are the reservoir? Um, although, mm. as we've said, there's a, a kind of unknown intermediate host that we just let's mm. let's just put that aside for a moment. But uh, so, what kind of sentinel are bats? Was one mm. question. Then there's a question about stereotypes of bats. Whether mm. you know whether you've had a chance to think through bat culture, bat aesthetics. And then my additional question I was wondering about: Are there bat watchers? Is there like a bird mm. watching community for bats? Mm. Mm. Well, that's that's the um, the research that I'm going to lead in the in the, in the next years because I'm going to return to China to investigate to investigate these wet markets. I, I doubt that you can find bats in these wet markets. Uh, I, I don't know that bats are consumed in, in Chinese um, uh, traditional medicine. I know they are in Aboriginal uh, societies and uh, also in Papua New Guinea, but um, I don't think it, it is. Um, and it's often used as a way to criticize traditional uh, Chinese culture to say, well, they eat bats, but uh, I don't think they eat bats. So I, I would not consider bats as a sentinel. For me, the analogy is between uh, bats and this intermediary animal like pangolins or others, and then humans. And then on the other side, uh, wild birds, poultry, and humans. So the sentinel will be this intermediary uh, animal. So it's very interesting, all these debates we had about the pangolin because uh, we, we're not sure that the pangolin is, is the, the real transmitter, but we are sure that in the last 10 years, the number of pangolins consumed in Chinese traditional medicine has increased and there's, a, there's been a global trade in pangolins coming from Africa. And so the, the, the Chinese authorities are, have wanted to control, particularly under the pressure of environmental uh, associations, to control the trade of pangolins. So pangolin will be a good sentinel animal uh, to think about, to enter uh, this world of wet markets, which is very complex actually, because you, you have a mix of wild and domestic animals, legal, illegal, food and medicine. It's a very complex uh, site and contact zone, but very interesting to investigate. Then, then, then the, the role of bad carers will be very interesting because, so, uh, I've worked with um, Arnaud Morvan, who is a specialist of Aboriginal communities, and we've, 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 we're, going, we're going to write an article together on uh, bad carers in, in, in Australia and, and, and Ghana, actually, because there's a lot of research on, on bats 
uh, on bad viruses in Ghana and, and Australia after Hendra virus. So, so the, these two sites are, have been observed in the last 10 years uh, for uh, uh, relations between humans and bats as sites of emergence of new viruses. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't know if, if other sites like Malaysia or Bangladesh, where there's been uh, the Nipah virus, uh, have been sites where bat carriers have been involved. But we know that uh, virologists have worked with bat carriers in most of the sites where there's been emergence of viruses from, from bats. And, and also in Europe, if you think of uh, Christian Drosten, who is now the main advisor of Angela Merkel for coronaviruses, he, he, he's been observing bats in, precisely in Ghana and in Germany for the last 15 years. And, and, I, and I know his work with bats. Bat, bat carers, bat, bat, bat lovers, if you want. And bats, bats for many reasons, are, are very uh, fascinating animals <clears throat> to observe and, 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 and theorize about um, their colonies, uh, their flying mammals, their immune system is amazing. That's why when they, we have viruses coming from bats, our immune system collapses because their immune system is so strong. Um, their faces are so different. Uh, so, so there are plenty of reasons to be passionate about bats, right? And the imaginary of bats as the kind of reverse animals, you know, with the head uh, below, uh, downsized, uh, as, as blurred our uh, observations about, about bats. Yes, there's so many uh, vampire popular shows <laughs> these days. So it's, bats are very uh, popular as well as scary. Um, um, and maybe just to continue on that, like the wet market again. So yes, yeah, you say a fascinating site, and I can't wait to see uh, what you come up with. Um, reading one of the papers for uh, my colleague Edmund Kirksey's uh, coronavirus multi-species reading group, which you were um, involved in just a couple of weeks ago, there was one paper that talked about the animal handlers in the Wuhan wet market. I think as part of this bat. Uh, maybe the same paper that you mentioned um, showing that coronaviruses are in bats and the animal handlers had really high rates of coronavirus antibodies. Mm, mm. So the, uh, yeah, I don't know if you yet have done, um, found out about these animal handlers, but those animal handler um, animal relations I think will be mm. really interesting mm. and very shared by mm. lots of shared biology <laughs> yeah i don't know this paper but um i i know that uh, at the time of sars in 2003 the animal handlers were uh, the the first to um uh, raise alert on on the new coronavirus because some of them died or got sick but they were they were newcomers to the to the market and and those who worked in the market for a long time they had antibodies to all these coronaviruses um, so yeah, I guess there's a, there's a whole sociology of these animal handlers. It will be difficult to make uh, in the in the context of the post-COVID uh, pandemic. Yeah, yeah, because of the uh, legal questions. Um, so of course now, you know, the idea of sentinel is so interesting that everything looks like a sentinel to me now. <laughs> um, so our wet markets are like a sentinel of industrialization, where you know, we've got all those uh, environmental ideas about the um, the animals, wild animals becoming in close contact with mm, large amounts mm. of humans because of habitat destruction. Uh, mm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wouldn't describe a wet market as a sentinel because um, precisely... Uh, <clears throat> A wet market is a is a in, in the term of Anat Singh, a wet market is a is a friction is a is a is a resistance to globalization. It's 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 the unscalable part of uh, Chinese capitalism, uh, and that's that's what is very interesting about wet markets is that it's described in media um, Western media as this archaic you know zone where humans are in contact with uh, scary animals. But from the perspective of Chinese consumers, it's the place where you can find safe food. Because when you buy a live animal, like a chicken or, uh, or a fish, then you are sure it's fresh. If you buy fish, if you buy meat in a supermarket, 
And you are not sure that of the food safety of the supermarket because you don't trust the government and the and the and the and the in industrial communist system. Uh, then it's it's more secure to go to a wet market. And so, um, so so the fact that these wet markets have become in uh, dangerous places because of emerging viruses is 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 one of the side effects of. Uh, of capitalism, but it, but the wet market in itself is not a dangerous place. What is dangerous, from the perspective of of of, of China itself, is the change of behavior of bats, <laughs> which is the fact that bats are getting, getting closer to human habitats and sometimes infect animals that are sold on the wet market, right? So, so what, what would be the, the sentinel is precisely this, this, this space of the, this contact zones between bats and possibly pangolins or other animals that leads to the, uh, to the cluster in the wet market. But the wet market in itself is, a, is, a, is a, it's not a safe place, but it's a neutral place from a Chinese perspective. Mm. And I'm sure it's interesting to think about uh, buying a live animal and killing it and the relationship of the uh, on the one hand, a consumer buying something in a store and maybe a more of a hunter subjectivity right. of killing, sacrificing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot or... of hunters who bring animals to wet markets, actually. It's where you can find game, raw, raw meat, I mean, meat from wild animals. So there's some questions about something else that I, you know, might put to you is a sentinel, um, which is the uh, the the movement, the massive mobility on planes, and you mentioned that um, mm. uh, SARS was seen as a as a uh, plane virus because of the, yeah. the, the human spread. Um, so Natasha Finn, who, of course, you know and I know, is interested in the transmission of the viruses via humans, I presume, on planes, and on the other hand, migratory birds um, mm. moving between continents. So mm -hmm. I suppose on the one hand, there's, is does that work as what kind of an uh, analogy is that between migratory mm. birds and mm. human mobility? And then yeah. I suppose then my addition would be, yeah, whether we can uh. think about these um, global travellers as sentinels in that, you know, they will get it or they will, mm -hmm. like the, I suppose, from a medical perspective, the, the, um, um, the the re returned traveler is a whole kind of mm -hmm. is a whole uh, genre of medicine. Someone that's mm -hmm. come from somewhere else. Yeah. Well, the, when I thought why Hong Kong people were good sentinels for pandemic influenza, I thought well because they tend to think of themselves as birds. Uh, you know, like. It's the Levi Brule quote, like humans are birds. So in, in times of emergency, Hong Kong, I mean, humans, Hong Kong humans thinks that they are birds, particularly, if, for example, in 1997, they were afraid that they would be killed by the Chinese government. And instead of that, the Chinese government killed chickens. And so that's this very <clears throat> paradoxical identification of, of, a, of a human population to a, to a bird population. But then the identification becomes more complex as the, uh, as the surveillance uh, becomes more ordinary, uh, because we need to make a distinction between two types of birds, which is domestic poultry, stuck into cages. And a, a lot of uh, Hong Kong citizens compare themselves to chickens in, in, in batteries, you know, in cages, and, and say, well, the Hong Kong government is, is, is uh, is scared by uh, H5N1 because we live like chickens in a cage. And the other uh, identification they, they made is, is we love watching wild birds because they are free, like us. And we are stuck into this tiny territory uh, <clears throat> on the border of this massive continent full of threats, but we can escape. We can take a flight and go to the rest of the world. And so there's this contradictory identification to domestic poultry on one side and wild birds on the other side. And I think that what made that's that's what made the, the identification with um, uh, with chickens with birds as sentinel uh, animals for Hong Kong so strong. Um, and <clears throat> and of course the idea that that um, uh, the, the the spread of influenza by migratory birds 
uh, resonates with uh, the global tendency to uh, use planes uh, increasingly, although we are now stuck by the, the, the global lockdown. Um, but it's really, it's really a Hong Kong concern. I mean, this city would not have survived if it had not had, thanks to the British government, uh, a very strong and um, modern uh, airport. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I suppose just uh, pushing that a little bit further. So you talked about, yeah, the pandemic response. Um, and just as you talk about you know, the, the signal, um, the signal of the sentinel can be, it could be a decoy, it can be a lure, you can respond with complacency in a respond, mm. under respond, but you can also have an overreaction. And I'm so glad it was lovely to hear you mm. talk about this cytokine storm, um, which is, uh, I think, currently thought to be the, the way that so many that people who get very severe COVID-19 disease and, and have very high mortality is from this overreaction of their own immune system. But I wanted to think about the COVID response itself, and is there, mm. does it does it work to make the argument, you know, mm. I'm, I'm not kind of myself going on, on either side of this, but that the response itself mm. um, is an overreaction in terms mm. of, um, you know, in countries where it has worked, it's, all, it's always the epidemiological problem that when the response works and everyone, then mm. the, the disease is not much of a problem like it currently mm. is in Australia, and then the, mm. um, the, the sacrifice made in the response mm. itself in terms of employment, mm. um, in terms of poverty, becomes potentially an overreaction. Mm. Yeah, well, that's where I rely on the, on the theory of uh, Ahmad Zahavi, uh, which is a, an ornithological uh, theory. Uh, which I actually borrowed to Vincienne Desprez because she, she was the Belgian philosopher Vincienne Desprez has been the first to work with uh, Zahavi in the 1990s. Uh, because of course, like, as a Foucauldian philosopher, I am tempted to consider like uh, Giorgio Agamben that uh, uh, global lockdown is, um, is an authoritarian uh, response of, of, uh, of neoliberal uh, states um, as, a, as a reaction of panic uh, to, to the emergence of this new uh, disease and that, uh, that it basically threatens our, our freedom as, as modern citizens. But if you take, if you take a, a, a kind of naturalistic uh, perspective or ethological uh, perspective on, on what happened, uh, it's actually a kind of um, a, a chain reaction where um, every, every state uh, threatened by the pandemic imitated uh, the, the measures of lockdown that has been applied in, in Wuhan, right? Well, this is a kind of very Latourian idea of Wuhan innovated in implementing lockdown as a, as a measure, lockdown at, at the level of uh, millions of people that never been uh, tried in the history of medicine. So, so Wuhan innovated and then the rest of the world was so, so uh, siderated or, or uh, surprised by this innovation that they, they only had to imitate Wuhan because um, uh, if you did less than Wuhan, uh, then you were considered as a weak government. And that's what happened to Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and Bolsonaro. So it's very interesting to think of, of what happened in this kind of competition. I, I call it the, you know, the, there's the classification of Shanghai. You, you comp no, you don't know that in Australia, but in France, you compare Australia uh, you, sorry, in France, we compare university uh, to uh, each other by um, a, a classification of Shanghai, Shanghai classification. And I said that there's a Wuhan classification, uh, which is to compare the performance of uh, 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 nation states in, in confronted with the pandemic by comparison with what happened in Wuhan, right? And so to understand this, this very bizarre phenomenon, um, I, I rely on the theory, I think it confirms the theory of, of Zahavi uh, on the behavior of uh, 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 sentinel birds. So what he observes is that in the, in the Negev desert, when there's a predator and you can think of a virus as a predator, uh, the, 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 the birds are going to the branch, the birds that are feeding on the ground, some of them are going on the branch of a tree. 
But instead of shouting loudly at the predator, um, instead of one bird shouting loudly at the predator with the risk of being seen by the predator, of being killed by the predator, and in some way sacrificing itself so that the rest of the flock can fly away, you have dozens <laughs> of birds on the same branch and they sing different songs. Um, and it's like a choir. And what happens in, in the idea of Zahavi is that uh, the, the choir communicates with the predator to say, look, we've seen you. There's no, it's not worth uh, you attack us. And they also communicate with the rest of the flock, which in Zahavi's Darwinian theory is females. And uh, I don't know how we can check that, but maybe it's... So he, say, he, saw, he says it's, he thinks it's, it's males on the branch and females on the ground. And so the males are, are, are communicating with the females to say, look, we, we have value. Uh, we are strong enough to, 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 fe to face the predator. I think it's pretty, it's, it's pretty much what happened. So we have a, a variation of different reactions to the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. And in, in front with SARS-CoV-2, all the national states say, look, we're strong enough. And they compete with each other to say, we're strong enough to, to, to face you. And, and this is precisely what is sentinel behavior. It's not sacrifice, because of course, at the, at the level of the individual, it's a sacrifice. But at the level of the state, each state, each state to preserve its uh, value, it's um, uh, in, in a kind of global competition, has to uh, 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 differentiate itself to other states, right? And that's what, that's for an anthropologist makes the, the, the global measures uh, uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2 so interesting is, is precisely these variations, right? So it's, it's like a global choir or a global dance with, with the emerging virus. Mm, I would just add to that, it's, that's, it's a beautiful point. I would add to that though, at the immunological level we are, hiding from the virus in this display yeah. of lockdown. And that's precisely the idea of Zahavi because Zahavi work with immunologists is to say, sentinel behaviors uh, send costly signals, costly signals, because it's risky for the sentinel to face the predator. And the, it's, it's costly in the sense, if, 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 um, if birds were rational utilitarian actors, there would be just one bird shouting, sacrificing itself, and then the rest of the birds would fly away, right? But then there's this, this will of the birds to compete with each other and send costly signals, which for Zahavi is the birth of aesthetics, uh, of, of beauty, it's a beautiful sound. But also he compares it to the behavior of immune cells. When immune cells are infected by um, viruses, they, 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 they are looking for the proper signal to, uh, uh, to communicate with the, with the virus. And if they, if they don't find, then, then they die. Then uh, this is apoptosis, which is a kind of sacrifice of, of the cell, right? So, so the, 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 the overreaction of the immune system is, is one of the risks of sentinel behavior. If, if the, if the, if the uh, uh, chain signaling, is this, if the chain of signals is not, is not harmonious enough, then it provokes this massive death of the organism. Mm, so will, time will tell whether the display of, of lockdown will actually deter the virus or not, or whether the kind of herd immunity approach, which is a sacrifice, a number of That's people right. will die, but, but the population as a whole will become immune, whether that is, mm. you know, inevitable. <laughs> and just the last point because we'll, we, we have to finish shortly. It was such a great conversation. I had to mention that the, when you showed the um, dendritic cell, it did, uh, I wondered, I thought about aesthetically that how the coronavirus in its, itself simulates the dendritic cell with all of its little, That's right. of course, mm -hmm. the coronavirus is tiny, tiny compared to that cell, mm. but I just thought, yeah, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, the images of uh, viruses uh, are very telling. Uh, if you think of Ebola, Ebola is the, it's called the shepherd's crook. So it's, it's, it's the protein that unfolds itself at the end. So it looks like it has an intentionality. And if you take uh, SARS, or well, most viruses are actually have this capsid form. So this thing like unfolded upon themselves, but actually viruses have no intention. So what they want to do is 
infect the cell and, and replicate through the nuclear of the cell. And that's why these receptors, these little spike proteins are so important because that's, that's the space of communication between the virus and the cell. Well, I have really enjoyed uh, communicating with you, Frederick, and with <laughs> our audience on our YouTube. Um, and I actually want to announce a Science and Society Network competition of inspired by talking to you, which is unprecedented. So, I mean, you did Australia comes quite a lot into the story um, and people mm. who should read the book will see that and because I'm a mm. proud Australian uh, researcher. Um, the movie um, Contagion, which is a, we started off with a series with um, um, Priscilla Wald, who showed us a clip from Contagion and it, it's such a, it is, I think, a really good movie that um, uh, demonstrates so many of the, the points we've been making. There are two uh, references to Australia, to Australian mm. things in Contagion. Mm -hmm. There maybe there's more, but there's two that I picked up. So if anyone in the audience can think of those two, and you, if you, Frederick, if you want to do it, I, you will win um, a uh, Science and Society Network water bottle and or a Science and Society Network mug. You can decide. So I will send that to you. Um, so with that exciting competition, um, I want to share uh, myself um, information about our, um, our seminar next week. So we have Professor Ian Ung from the University of Western Sydney, who will be talking to us about uh, transitioning to a better world beyond the crisis. And mm. um, that will be very, very exciting. Oh, I see actually the time and date is the date of today. So it will be next week, um, next Tuesday, um, at back to the time of uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. So I hope uh, everyone can join us for that. And then that was our second last seminar. So um, it's been really exciting. Um, can I share an observation? Yes. The logo for the Alfred Deakin Institute looks like a pangolin. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the sentinel for <laughs> the COVID-19. That's it. It's a pangolin. Well, that means it must be a pangolin in the end. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. The poor pangolins, if they okay. are, hopefully they won't be culled. Um, that would be terrible. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, thank you so much, Frederick, for your time. It's, it's great to talk thank to you. you. Okay. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.